Member safety is a matter of your life or your death. I never in my wildest dreams thought I'd be in a situation to where I would have a nine millimeter held to my head. It was a day like any other when James Olson an agent with more than 35 years experience, set out to meet a blind lead at a vacant property, something he had done countless times before. I was actually with my wife on the way to an appointment. I had never met this person, and she was sitting on the front porch waiting for me, and I just told my wife to wait in the car. We walked through the living room, the dining room, and the kitchen. Now I've been in this property a number of times, and it just seemed odd to me that all the doors were closed. So I went to grab the bedroom door, and out came a masked gunman holding a nine millimeter to my head. He was all dressed in black like a ninja. He had a hoodie on, sunglasses, face mask, black gloves, black everything. Within a couple seconds, another guy dressed the same held a nine mil up against the side of my head. I had my hands up in the air and he said, get down to the floor. So I took his gun and he hit me in the back of the head. I went falling to my knees. Blood was flowing in my eyes. They're asking me where the money is and I told them I didn't have any, so they rifled my pockets and pulled my pants down and socks and shoes off. And they wound up making away with my wedding ring, my wallet, and my iPhone. They came back to me and said, give us 10 minutes or we're coming back here and killing you. These guys are out there, and if they attack me, more than likely they're going to be going after somebody else. This was a predatory assault. They didn't just randomly picked me, they stalked me. Jim Olson was surveilled and targeted based on his job as collecting rents as a property manager. They knew what date to lure him into the property that was vacant so he could be robbed at gunpoint. Studies have shown that agent male victims were attacked 30% of the time. And we know with Jim Olson, and he's a big burly man, infantry soldier, never was in fear that something could happen, and he was a victim of a violent robbery. And now, listen to his story, he changes the way he does business. He arrives at a home much earlier than the appointment time and does a circumference of the house to see if there's anything out of place or if there's any broken windows or forced entry. Kitty Wallace, a managing broker with almost 20 years experience, has faced off with numerous predators. One of my most recent experiences was from a gentleman who wanted to see a home. I have a practice that I have them meet me at the office for the first time. This particular gentleman didn't want to meet me at the office, so that did put a red flag up for me. Working in a rural area with limited cell phone reception, Kitty remained steadfast in her safety protocols, but the caller had a plan of his own. He was very insistent and it was, can you meet me there in an hour? And I said, no, unfortunately, I can schedule an appointment with you. We can sit down and see what your needs are. No, 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 I want to see this house. And he said, OK, then meet me in two hours. He just kind of kept moving the time frame for me. And when that escalated and he wouldn't meet me, he ended up calling my office. He was swearing at me, saying that, you know, that's my job. I need to meet him here. What is my seller going to do when he finds out I won't show him this property, et cetera? And I just didn't let myself get bullied. I really stood my ground and didn't meet with him at all. I've always kind of just accepted it's part of the job, and that's really not OK. So I reported it to my local association, and they sent an email blast to all the agents. Two other agents reached out to me, and they had also been approached by this gentleman. Maybe I prevented something bad happening not only to myself, but maybe somebody else as well. I do believe that the intent of some clients is not to buy a house. The intent is to see what they could do. 
if they got me a loan. Jim and Kitty's harrowing stories display the two types of predatory motives, profit and power and control. There is a misconception that crimes against agents are random opportunistic street crime, and in fact, they're of predatory nature. And by understanding predator behavior and learning that you can remove weakness, subservience, and vulnerability out of your daily practice, you'll be able to keep yourself safe. I think realtor safety is one of the most important things that any realtor can learn about. The goal of the realtor safety program is to reduce the number of incidents in our industry so this week come home to your family every night you deserve it and they deserve it i think having these protocols in place is definitely the key to saving my life 99.9% .9 of the time our job is amazing it's that 0.01% that's not worth my life Good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. This is Jeremiah's J-Man Monero with J-Man Speaks coming to you live with A-Team Fridays. Ask the experts anything meaningful Friday. This being Realtor Safety Month, super appropriate to have a safety expert on with us. We wanted to start you out with that that professionally produced video. Man, that was pretty awesome. Uh, but we're going to bring on our special guest. His name is Dave Lagaz, NYSAR president, safety expert, retired NYPD sergeant, uh, avid runner, Overall, nice guy. Most of the time, no. <laughs> um, I've known him since before. He was cool. So, thanks, thanks for being on the show, Mr. Lagaz. Thank you, Jeremiah. It's a pleasure. Uh, so let's just get right into it. Uh, talk a little bit about the the realtor safety program that NAR is putting together. Let's start there. Sure. So, as you saw in the video, we're changing the uh, curriculum. In the past, we thought crimes against agents were random opportunistic street crimes, but in fact, reports show that they are predatory in nature. So we're training the agents now how to identify predator behavior and how to remove the attractors that attract a predator, and those that is weakness, subservience, and vulnerability. Yeah, I, I like, and that's why I wanted to, to, to bring you on. It's like, because it, it's such a different approach. So for so many years, we heard about, you know, safety and and bring this with you and use pepper spray or all these other, but it's like not being in that position in the first place, you know, like, like the second, uh, person who was interviewed, um, or if it does happen or how to avoid it or, or how to put these safety measures in place. What if I'm watching this and I love that they talked about males cause some, so often like the macho bravado were like, Oh, it never happened to me. I'm really tough. I was a wrestler in high school. Uh, I love that they mentioned that, but somebody's watching this. They don't really have a safety protocol in place. Maybe they're a broker. Maybe they're a manager. Maybe they're an agent uh, and don't know what the office safety protocol is. Like, where would you start? How, how would you start with that? Sure. Well, we have to acknowledge that first we have a high risk occupation. And matter of fact, the U.S. Department of Labor actually classified real estate professionals as a high risk occupation. And the Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics states that we're averaging about 20 homicides a year of real estate professionals since wow. 2011. And to drive that home even more, there are more real estate professionals killed every year than NYPD officers. Wow. Agents across the nation are killed more frequently than NYPD officers. And as a retired police sergeant, I was prepared to protect life and property. I had a belt that contained many tools, a firearm, mace, a baton, handcuffs, all these tools, but as a realtor, we don't have those tools. All we have is that instinct, that voice inside your head, that sixth sense that something may be wrong. And every realtor victim I interviewed when I when I wrote my book, all had that that feeling before, and they wished they didn't go through on the appointment. They rationalized that feeling. So I would say starting with that is to recognize that that feeling that something may be wrong. And. So let's say, you know, it's, it's when I talk to agents, it's like, well, you know, I'm a new agent. I got to get a deal. I need business. And it, it's, there's, there's no transaction that's worth, worth your life. Right. I mean, exactly. How, how do you think, um, like, what are some best practices for offices? Like I, uh, the second, uh, interviewee, she talked about how like their protocol was come to the office first, meet me at the office. I know there's, 
products like uh, Forewarn or other ways that you can kind of verify people before uh, before you meet them? What what do you think? And it and from a fair housing perspective too, right? I mean, you have to treat everybody the same. You can't just say, Dave, you sound creepy on the phone. Come to my office, and then J Man sounds like a nice guy. <laughs> I'll just <laughs> meet him at the house, right? I mean, it's got to be everybody the same. Exactly. So the, the first thing we do is, is we talk about something called active listening. And I used to always say, well, never meet someone at the property for the first time. Meet them at your office. They used to say, introduce them to your front desk, take their ID, photocopy it. But we found that predators don't care if they know who, who, they, who you, they know if, that you know who they are because they don't get caught and 80% of the crimes go unreported. Uh, but what that'll do by meeting them at a place prior to the appointment is going to give you extra time to realize whether I should take a buddy with me on the appointment. You're going to do some active listening. You're going to say, well, why did you uh, inquire about this property? Well, because I heard it had some good school districts or it's close to my transportation. Well, what's important to you about that? And you peel down the onion and then you could see if that, that buyer is a true buyer or someone of predatory nature. A normal buyer could answer those questions instantaneously, but a predator may stumble. And if you see them stumbling, you could decide not to go on the appointment, come up with an excuse, or take a buddy with you. And you talked about these apps like uh, that check For the backgrounds. Yeah, forewarn. Um, unfortunately, there is uh, a large error rate in those databases, about a 30% error rate. It only contains 13% of the convictions and serial rapists oh, and sex abusers have uh, would have victimized 11 people prior to actually being arrested or having something on their record. So you may get a full sense of security by putting a name in an app and it comes up clear, but it's not the same database that the FBI, your state police or local police use. It's a commercial database wrought with many errors. So that alone should not make you feel safe. Man, what what a good point. And especially if somebody has like a common name, John Smith or something, or, or maybe they assume the identity of somebody that has uh, a clean background history. Well, what, what do you want to, we do have some videos that we can show them. Do you want to get into that yet? Or tell, tell uh, me no, let's go. go. Yeah, let boss, me talk Sergeant. about, <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> let me, let me talk about predatory behavior. Okay. So uh, the University of Texas at Austin, we commissioned them to do a study on behavioral therapy, on uh, the behaviors of a therapy. And there is about uh, seven stages of a predator. And at each cycle, uh, we'll describe wh what they're doing, either with you knowing or without you knowing. So a predator's motive is power and control, and there's a huge emotional component to their crime. And all the activities leading up to the crime, they get a high of it off of it. It's an obsessive compulsive cycle. It's almost like a binge alcoholic. They'll do anything to get to that, uh, that high. So the first thing they're going to do is they're going to focus on you and they're going to look at your, your photographs. And I'll talk about what a photograph should look like. Um, they're going to, they're going to then go from your photographs to your Facebook, to your, your, your marketing, to your Instagram, to all your social media and your website to see, well, are they showing signs of weakness, subservience, and vulnerability in the marketing? Then they're going to focus on the fantasy stage. And the fantasy stage is kind of weird. They're going to place you with them in a fantasy world. So if they research me, they'll see I'm an, I'm an avid fisherman. I love to uh, cook what I catch. I make great meals and I serve great wines with it. For the predator, he's on the boat with me and I'm baiting his hook. He's in the kitchen prepping the food and he's at my dining room table and I'm pouring my glass of wine. And he does this to several different agents all at one time without you even knowing it. So it's important to determine how we actually present ourselves online. Then he's gonna plan the meeting when the fantasy and stalking is no longer provides a high for him, he's gonna call out and schedule an appointment. He'll execute the plan. He'll tell you to, to meet at a vacant property. He would have selected the property already because he needs to get you vac in, in a vacant home where you cannot be seen or heard so he can attack you. And then he'll, he'll, he'll have that meeting with you. And depending on his urges that day, he may be a no-show. So for all the times that we made, met the buyer for the first time at a property and they don't show up, that could have been a predator. And we've all had no-shows. 
Yeah. Because that morning, his his urges weren't there for him to come commit the crime. And that's called victim shopping. There's uh, the, the woman in Encino, California, that we all saw on YouTube and the news where she was hosting the open house, pushed off the oh, yeah. off the porch, yeah. fell down and she was sexually abused. That Vic, that uh, predator was walking by the property the week earlier. He was seen by other people at other open houses and he was victim shopping, waiting to find the right agent in the right moment to attack. And then they're going to set the stage. They're going to isolate you and they're going to try to tell you, hey, go there's a leak in the basement or there's a leak in the bedroom, uh, in the bathroom. And then the attack's going to occur and you'll see signs of adrenaline just prior to the attack. The typical signs of sweatiness, the bulging of the neck veins, uh, his, the predator's gait may come closer to yours and get into your, your space, making you feel uncomfortable. Uh, and that's probably the last time you're going to have an opportunity to actually get away from, from the predator. But let's talk about what it takes to uh, to have a crime to occur. You need you need motive, means, and opportunity. And this is basic criminology 101. So the motive is a reason. The means is the ability, and the opportunity is a chance to commit the crime. The motive we know the motive for a predator is power and control. They're going to isolate you so they can attack, sexual abuse, rape, or even murder you. And the predator is going to look for signs of weakness, subservience, and vulnerability. So we really can't do anything about the motive, but we can talk about the means and opportunity. So one of the ways to uh, remove the means, picture this as a three-legged chair, where you have motive, means, and opportunity. You take one of those legs off, the chair falls down, and the crime doesn't occur. So we have to start with something I call smart marketing. And that's, don't tell the, the, your buyer, well, I live around the corner in this neighborhood on Main Street in that brick house. Our kids go to this school. We go to this uh, this uh, after school program or this house of worship. Now you just told the miscreant every way they could attack you right. and stalk you. And this is from real victims, real agent victims who were at church or shopping in town and see and saw them being stalked. And then your professional photos uh, could attract a predator for power motive or profit motives. We know Beverly Carter. She was a beautiful woman. She had one of those glamour shots that the women used to do. And some of the men back in the eighties and nineties and early two thousands, where you had your hair and makeup did, you had the string of pearls on and you want to look like you were successful, but her predator, uh, targeted her because she was a rich broker, rich broker working alone. And we have to get away from making ourselves look, like that to attract a predator and something as simple as your photos on a business card. Not many people in our industry in the auxiliary industry, your mortgage, your, your accountants, your loan office, uh, your, uh, attorneys have photos on their business cards. We do, but the photo has to be a professional photo. You want to avoid the head tilt. You want to avoid a smile that says, Hey, you know, you just heard that someone loves you and you have that head tilt smile that's going to attract the predator. And it's something as simple as that. It's interesting because that that was my go-to. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's like, Mm. yeah. What, what about, um, like a tire in the photos? Like, you know, with the guys, I always, I always think this cliche, like the, you know, (laughs) with the crossing of the arms with an expensive watch that maybe they got, you know, it's a Rolex that ticks. It's not really <laughs> right. <laughs> trying to trying to look look the part, just just like you said. Um, would you would you say more business casual or still business, but just kind of tone it down a little bit with less of the the jewelry? Yeah, exactly. You want to uh, avoid full body photos wherever possible. Use photos that are right at or above the shoulder. Be professional. Wear a shirt that goes no lower than the top of the breastbone for women. Possibly wear a jacket. Um, Avoid wearing form-fitting clothes. Wear professional colors. Wear a jacket if possible. And women, your makeup should be natural and understated. And jewelry should be minimal. You know, a simple wedding band should be fine. Okay. And then 
you, in order, another way to remove the means is the way we market ourselves. So our marketing language have many connotations. The words we have, um, the words we use have an emotional value of over and above their literal meaning. And knowing that the predator is attracted to weakness, subservience, and vulnerability, it's essential to se select words that convey power, control, knowledge, and authority to reduce the attraction of the predator. So for example, a subservient example would be on your website or your marketing, I'm here to serve all your real estate needs. To a predator, that's very pro provocative. But an authoritative example would be, I'm experienced to handle the real estate process. So just simple change in the marketing and your language will also reduce the attraction of a predator. Dave, um, do you think, do you have something we could kind of put together, maybe put it in the comments and I'll add it in the, in the, in the details with this, with the marketing description type stuff? Because I think that's so powerful. Oh, definitely. I'll definitely yeah. give you uh, information on that. And then the way you could, you could uh, prevent being uh, vulnerable weak and subservient is on the initial call. You're going to want to use property information. You're going to say, uh, thank you for inquiring about 123 Main Street. This is one of our most popular listings. The home has plenty of windows accenting the, national, the, the natural daylight. So what you just told the predator is, hey, this is a popular listing. Someone else may be coming in during our showing. Maybe I won't choose that property or choose you to attack. And people could see from the outside because there's plenty of natural sunlight. Then the next thing you want to do is establish control and say, instead of showing, instead of meeting at 5 p.m., let's meet at 530. Even though you knew 5 p.m., you have keys to the property, there's a lockbox, the home was available, you're available. But by simply changing the time, you're taking back power and control and something that easy. And then you're going to set expectations. You're going to say, we're going to be spending no more than 15 minutes at this one property because the sellers are due home. And there's been many reports where attacks happen and the agent had said, well, the sellers are coming back, you know, and then the attack, the attack stops. So by using those three things, by establishing uh, boundaries, setting expectation, using the neighborhood information, you're not showing that you're uh, weak, subservient, your vulnerability, and you won't be targeted to be attacked. Yeah. And I think just to piggyback on that, now with showing time, you could really say like, the market's so busy you say look at okay we have a window from 5 30 to 5 45 but there's an, a showing immediately after and then another one after that um you could kind of use technology to your advantage uh, exactly in that example yeah and then so now we're coming we're, we're meeting the the buyer or the prospect we don't know if it's a prospect or a predator right because they hide themselves very well so at the showing you you want to have what i call an empowered greeting where you're going to be on the stoop and you're going to get there earlier uh, before, before the buyer comes and you're going to reach down and greet the, the prospect. And now this predator is forced to look up at you. And in his mind, you're no longer subservient because he's looking up at you and you're, and you're looking down at him. So that's an empowered greeting. Psychologically, you're not appearing weak or vulnerable. And then I would always suggest a firm handshake, but now with COVID, um, People may not want to do that, but a firm handshake is a universal sign of strength and assuredness, yeah. and it'll again remove any perception of being weak. But in lieu of that, a good nod of the of the head and an, an eye contact uh, would also suffice. So that's one of the couple of ways to remove the means. And we did speak about active listening. Uh, don't meet them at the property first. Go to another place. Active listening, and that may give you an opportunity to remove means. So now the third part of the leg is the opportunity. And, you know, we, you wouldn't tell your son or daughter to go on a job interview with a stranger in a vacant home, right? We do that every day, right. several times a day. So we have to think about removing that opportunity. And one way is to take a buddy. And NAR used to always say, well, always take a buddy on appointment. And we know always means never, right? Because we're never going to always do it. But here are four absolutes where you should bring a buddy with you on the appointment. If the property is vacant because we know a predator is going to lure you there so you cannot be seen or heard so they can attack. If there's poor cell phone coverage because you won't be able to access any of your safety apps, call 911. Uh, and then if there's an uncomfortable feeling prior to the appointment, many agents had that uncomfortable feeling 
whether it was during their text messages, their phone calls, their uh, buyer consultations. Um, and then they still went through the appointment and, and regretted that, not listening to that voice inside your head. And then if you haven't closed a deal in a while or if you're a newbie because you want to get the deal done, you may overlook those signs that your body's telling you, hey, you know, I have the sixth sense. Something may be wrong because your body is going to tell you even before you're able to recognize it that something may be wrong. So four times when the property is vacant, poor cell phone coverage, uncomfortable feeling prior, and if you haven't closed a deal in a while is when you should take a buddy with you. And the buddy doesn't have to be a licensed agent. It could be a family member. It could be a friend. It could be your admin if you have the admin. Uh, let me ask you this. So the, the buddy, because I know there's been instances where the, somebody brought somebody and they sit, sat in the car and something still happened. The buddy should come in with you to the house, right? Correct. Or, and most of the time it will, it, 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 it may prevent the, the attack in James uh, Olson's case. So we saw in the video, his wife was actually in the car. Right. Um, don't know if it would have escalated it because he was set up there with, for these gunmen to, to rob him. Um, they didn't take his car because she was in the car because the, the predators had said, well, because they took his keys after they took his clothes off, they took his keys and they were going to take his car. And then the woman said, who lured him there said his wife's in the car. So we don't know if that would have escalated or not, but generally most predators, um, we, we would prevent an attack if you had someone with you. Nice. Uh, and then well, let me talk. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm taking control here. Hold on. I'm on the stoop. <laughs> Thank you. So another way to remove opportunity is lockbox safety. And I've been on many a clubhouse uh, and, and learning about race and real estate. And there's, there's a, a, a problem out there that a lot of agents are not aware of, and that's selling while black. And I've listened and have so many friends who've told me, and I've included this in my national trainings now, about lockbox placements. And we saw the unfortunate incident at gunpoint where the agent, the buyer, and his son were, were held under arrest by police officers because the neighbor with racist intentions, I believe, had thought something was going wrong. Um, so let's talk about lockbox placement. Please place it on the front door in plain sight. When an agent has to go to the side of the house or the rear of the house, you're given the opportunity to the predator because obviously it's a vacant home. He lured you there, and now the predator's getting you in the yard where no one could see you. So there's so many problems. So try to keep the uh, lockbox on the front of the uh, property. Yeah, that's a great point because for so many years we were like, oh, we're going to put it on the side door because – we don't want agents to show up and use the lockbox without calling first. But yeah, I never thought about it from a safety perspective. Yeah. And for many different reasons, especially now learning, you know, the struggles that, you know, many agents of color face today. So let me give you three setting the stages. And these are the videos I sent you okay. uh, about uh, setting the stage on the bathroom attack. So when you hear these words, just know an attack is imminent. Ready? Yep. Yeah, I think there's a leak over here. Can we take a look? And it happens that fast where they're going to get you into a small room. They're going to distract you. And it could be there's a leak in the basement. There's a leak in the bathroom. And these are from true case studies of realtor victims. The next is the lookup attack. What's that? Yeah, I don't see and same concept, distract and strike. And if you've never been hit in the face before, I've never been in a fight, it's hard to get up off the ground when someone who's weighs more than you and stronger than you uh, is about to attack you. And then there's the hallway attack. Here it can be used as either a bedroom or an so you notice here, this could also happen at the top of the landing as you walk up the steps, but your gate is the same as, as the buyer or the predator. When that person slows down, generally you don't slow down because you're still keeping that same pace and now you're getting into his space. And as he goes to the doorway, you notice he put his hands up on the doorway. So if you see his hands go up, just know at that point, he's going to come around and strike you. And that happens so much at that that uh, door frame or on the top of a landing. 
So you could see his hands go up. As soon as you see his hands go up, the agent still keeps her pace and she walks right into that punch. Wow. The good thing is she was directing him, not leading him. We never give her back to the buyer. But she didn't control her gate and she walked right into it. So what is um back over here? Um I guess best practices arriving to the property, parking at the property, like you just said, like she's letting him lead, uh basements, that that kind of stuff. And maybe finish off with like recommended self-defense i know new york we're very different than we have people watching in montana tennessee um yeah everybody carries a gun just about and hardly anybody does where where we live exactly um i teach this across the country and i was in alaska a couple weeks ago and alaska is a very liberal gun state uh so much so when the police pull you over you have to declare how many guns you have in the car and where they're located it's wild uh yeah. but there have been agent victims who had a full sense of security because they had a gun on them or the, the female agent had it in the purse and the purse was on the kitchen table and she was in the dining room when she got attacked uh jim olson in my interview that didn't make the air said if he had a gun it would have been used against him if he was able to get it out so good. you just got to be good with run, gun retention um but NER survey showed 49 percent of agents carry a weapon where uh, for females, the, the highest uh, instance was pepper spray or mace, and for men were firearms. But I warn you that if you are going to carry a firearm, uh, make sure you go to the range regularly and, and practice gun retention. What about like the parking scenario, um, backing in, in the street, in the driveway? What, what are best practices there? Yeah, NAR used to always teach that, you know, don't get blocked in. Um, it's, I think if you do everything, including that, you'll be okay. Um, but yeah, the, the main thing is try not to get blocked in in the driveway, but that's not alone going to get you the cure-all. Yeah. It's the other things leading up to it. If you're in Queens, you just got to hope for a parking spot somewhere. Exactly, or, or not a summons. <laughs> All right, well, I, I promise to keep it running on 45 minutes. Is there anything kind of you want to close with? Um, we'll we'll yeah. post some links to reference everything that you're talking about. I already put a link to the to the realtor safety program that we showed in the beginning. Um, and there's a, there's a whole safety discussion series, it looks like, on there. Yeah, we'll definitely. Um, so what if I told you there was a safety tool out there that could prevent you from being victimized? It would issue a warning that you're about to make a terrible mistake. It's always on, doesn't require any batteries, and the tool is free. You would want to know what that is, right? Well, that's that voice inside your head, that sixth sense, that intuition, that gut feeling that something may be wrong. And most agents who are victims of a crime recall having these feelings that they try to rationalize and ignore, went through the appointment, and then they were also um, attacked. So... I would leave you with that. Listen, listen to your instincts. Well, we have we have one question here from Billy Parrish. She's in Billy and B Town, Billings, Montana. Uh, she says tips for open houses. Like, what do you recommend when you know? And I see this because I teach social media. At, hey, everybody! I'm at a open house all by myself. We got cookies. We got everything. Come see me. Uh, let's, I mean, that's a different story. But what are some other tips? Right. So what you want to do is at a, prior to an open house, notify the neighbors. You want to let the neighbors know that you're going to be there in Queens and in, in, in city areas. It's easy when pre COVID you would door knock, you know, you would tell the neighbors, Hey, I'm doing an open house from one to three. The sellers inviting you to come into preview between 12 and one. So this way, anyone who comes between 12 and one, and you know, it's a neighbor looking to find out what their home is valued at compared to that one. And you can get a listing conversation going as opposed to them coming in during the general open house of one to three. Circle so notify process. the neighbors. Yeah, it's great. It, it kills a couple stones. Um, you don't want to host it alone. What my team does is I'll, it'll be either myself and my wife, Nancy, at the open house with the buyer's agent and a loan officer. We control the traffic, one family, one party in at a time, and then one leaves. Uh, you want to plan escape routes. It's up to you if you want to lock all the doors or, or just 
keep one uh, open, you know, unlocked. I prefer to have all my doors locked so I know no one's going to sneak in behind me. Uh, you're going to ask for ID, not because it's going to prevent them from being a, from you being attacked per se because you know who they are, but again, you're showing that you're not weak or subservient because you're giving them orders to to comply to. Direct them, don't lead them, like we said. Uh, avoid basements that may be dark or damp. Uh, go to, uh, you know, there may be a leak. Avoid garages, attics, small rooms. And if you can't have someone come with the open house with you, have someone periodically check in, maybe every half hour, every 15 minutes. And if they don't hear from you, have them, uh, you know, come in and check out on you, check you out. And at the end of the open house is one of the most dangerous times because you know, the predator knows that no one's going to follow up at the end of the open house. Right. So you want to make sure that everybody's left the open house. And I've even been a victim of this a couple of years ago. I was at the open house with my buyer specialist and my loan officer. Loan officer had to run for an appointment at five to three. My buyer specialist goes to pick up her signs. Now I'm locking up the house by myself and I teach this. And here I am in a vacant home by myself. I go to the second floor and I'm checking all the rooms. A guy jumps out of the bathroom. We both startled each other, but I lost track of who was in the house and he could have easily attacked me if he was a predator. Uh, so check all the rooms in the yard before locking up them. Be prepared to defend yourself and just know at the end of the open house is one of the most dangerous. And if you can't have someone come with you to spend the whole time, have someone drop you off and pick you up and make sure that there's no one in the home waiting for you like it was with Jim Olson. He walked in to a house that was already uh, broken entry into. So those are some, some of the tips that will uh, keep you safe for an open house. Yeah. Um, and I'll just, let me add a video tip with that guys. You could do a virtual open house along with the in-person open house so that you're live streaming the entire time or to a zoom or something like that. And then people can see as they come in, Oh, look at, we're also live streaming this. So if you know somebody that can't make it, um, I'd be happy to give you the link and it can kind of give you another, uh, another layer of security. But in regards to the windows and doors, I'd, I know that was a thing where for a while they would kind of creep to a, a, a room, leave one of those windows unlocked to come back and break in too, right? Yeah, exactly. There, there's something that I, I call the uh, dust check. If you ever had a bar, you go into the home and they're say oh, in the yeah. bedroom and they run their finger along the headboard, look for dust, run it along the dresser, look for dust. And then they go to the window, that double hung window where the latch is, and they run their finger across, and then all of a sudden they just unlock the door for a future entry, lock unlock the window. So it's it does happen. Wow. And I think there was someone who on here just said that uh, in the garage, people people stalk and wait for you before the open house as well. So do you think? Because this this is like one of my biggest pet peeves is when I used to do open houses, I try not to do them anymore if at all possible. But um, when they come and it's, it's one to three and it's three Oh one and somebody's pulling up, can I get in the house? Can I, and I'm like, no, no, it's one to three. Have your agent call to show it or something like that. It's like, Oh, and exactly too, because that could be the predator knowing that no one's coming in afterwards and you know, you're uh, going back in. Do you, do you think like start like start to close up a few minutes early, five minutes early? Like if they're planning to come back right at the end, maybe if you're five minutes before you're supposed to be closed up, so you could be grabbing all your signs by the time your open house is finishing. Or what do you what do you? What do you no, think? I prefer not to do anything alone at an open house. Okay. Awesome. Well, Mister Lagaz, I thank you, my friend, um, sharing your expertise with us. Uh, you know, we're going to share this with us. It, we'll upload it to a, to our YouTube channel as well so that we can try to help uh, as many agents as possible be safe, not just during Realtor Safety Month, but always. Uh, and, and, and I know you're a big part of the Beverly Carter Foundation. Anything you want to speak to that? Um, reference the site yes. that they can go in. Yeah, so Beverly Carter Foundation, um, it's a great organization. We're all aware of Beverly from Little Rock, Arkansas. She was one of us. She did everything right that NAR used to teach, and she uh, unfortunately was kidnapped and murdered. Um, the goal of the Beverly Carter Foundation is same as the real the uh, safety program for NER is we want to prevent the incidences of happening and create more awareness. Uh, when I teach across the country, I do not collect a speaking fee. I just ask the association or brokerage to make that donation to the Beverly Carter Foundation. 
So we've, we're putting it in the comments right now. And if you guys are looking for a speaker for realtor safety and you don't have a budget <laughs> and it can benefit, you know, a great cause. So thanks again, Mr. Lagaz. Thank you guys for tuning in again. Every Friday, ask yes for anything meaningful Friday. We're going to give Mr. Lagaz a round of applause and thank you so much. This is Jeremiah's J-Man Monero with J-Man Speaks. Make it a great day. Stay safe. Thank you. Please be safe out there.